My name is Kathy Vaughn Holland, and some of you may know me as the Literacy Coordinator at the Tahlequah Public Library. My latest book today for review is called The First Wave, The D-Day Warriors Who Led the Way to Victory in World War II. And this is the cover of the text. The author is a fellow named Alex Kershaw. The book came out in 2019. If you remember, 2019 was D-Day's 75th anniversary year, and the publisher is Penguin Random House. Kershaw is a well-known author of many military histories, and this is one of his most current books. The book is divided into three parts, and I'll tell you right now, I'm only doing the first part. Part one is called Twilight of the Idols, which covers 4 a.m. in England, to 5 a.m. at the Merville Gun Battery. Part two is called The Day, June 6, 1944, and covers from first light at 5.58 a.m. with Lord Lovett's British commandos, led by Major John Howard, as he and his troops plotted to capture Pegasus Bridge, which they had done by 7 p.m. that evening to Point de Hoc at 11.30 p.m. as American Lieutenant George Kirchner and the survivors of D Company hung on to that terrain and hoped and prayed for reinforcements. Finally, part three is called The Killing Fields, which covers June 7th from the aftermath on the five invasion beaches, those beaches being Utah and Omaha beaches were the American beaches. Gold and Sword beaches were the British. And Juneau Beach was the Canadian beach. Omaha Beach was under the command of American soldiers. On Pont de Hoc, Lieutenant Kirchner and his men were still under attack by the Germans. While on Sword and Gold beaches, British troops left the beachheads and headed inland. Kershaw spends time on Operation Market Garden, which some of you may remember was chronicled in the film A Bridge Too Far, and it's also covered in the miniseries Band of Brothers. He briefly discusses the American drive to Aachen, the first German city to be targeted by the Americans, and then he heads straight into the Battle of the Bulge. The book concludes in 2018 with former French soldier Leon Gaudier, one of only five surviving French commandos out of an original 177, who had landed in the first wave on D-Day. Gaudier was, quote, surrounded by grateful visitors from the U.S. and Britain who had come to honor him. This is a book I both avidly wanted to read and yet was frankly terrified to do so. But I had hung on for dear life through the opening half hour of Saving Private Ryan, and I have visited France and the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial at Colville sur Mer and seen all 9,385 white crosses and stars of David, under which lie the bodies of American GIs killed on D-Day and D-Day plus the days that followed D-Day. So I just decided to go for it to try to do justice to the survivors as well as the dead. The book opens at 4 a.m. on June 5th, 1944 with Supreme Allied Commander and later our American 34th President, Dwight David Eisenhower, wrestling with whether to green light the invasion or delay it due to terrible weather. We've all heard about the bad weather on D-Day. Finally, Eisenhower's chief meteorologist, Group Captain James Stagg, a Scotsman, informed Eisenhower and his Overlord commanders, Operation Overlord, that the weather would clear that afternoon, remember this is June 5th, and stay that way for another 30 hours. While relieved at the forecast, Eisenhower remained very worried that Stagg could be wrong. After all, the consequences would be staggering if he was wrong. The crushing weight of such a decision, whether to launch the greatest military invasion in the history of all warfare and send 7,000 vessels, 12,000 planes, and 160,000 Allied troops into battle might have stymied a lesser leader. But Eisenhower, working 18-hour days and continually reviewing and tweaking 
invasion plans, hold it off in spite of everything. Among his tweaks, he did three things. He added one third more troops to the total number, quote, of whom fewer than 15% had actually experienced combat, quote. Two, he broadened the invasion front by almost 60 miles. Think about that. By adding Utah Beach, Utah is the furthest beach to the west of all the D-Day beaches. And three, he coaxed his, quote, bunch of prima donnas, most of them British, who made up most of his command into agreeing with him that their night attack would be helped by the late rising moon's light, quote. Eisenhower was not confident of success and paced the room incessantly. My feeling is that the pressure had to have been soul crushing, especially since, quote, there was no plan B, quote. For five minutes, Eisenhower paced the room with his high commanders, patiently awaiting his final decision. Finally, he calmly stopped pacing and announced to the men in the room, quote, okay, we'll go, quote. And I want to say here briefly in passing that there are many accounts, written accounts, of what Eisenhower actually said to Greenlight D-Day. Unfortunately, no account, even if the person writing is remembering of the account, no one account agrees with any other. There, they all say he said different things. Eisenhower himself could not remember what he actually said. So just keep that in mind. Once Ike's decision was made, it was passed along to his generals. General Maxwell Taylor notified Captain Frank Lilligan, who since December 1943 had commanded the 101st Airborne's Pathfinders. When I went to Normandy in 2019, I made sure to pick up these insignias of the two main divisions that dropped into Normandy. You'll all recognize the Screaming Eagles of the 101st Airborne. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, also known as the All-Americans or the 80 Deuce. So all of these Pathfinders found out from Lilliman that the mission was a go, and then the message was burned. Kershaw says that these Pathfinders had recently watched a movie about Geronimo, the legendary Chiricahua Apache warrior, and had cut their hair into mohawks. As you all know, Tahlequah is the capital of the Cherokee Nation. I used to teach the Cherokee history class, and the Apache Nation is vastly different from the Mohawk Nation. The Mohawks are from the far northeastern U.S., and the Apaches are from Arizona. So why well, they felt like I had to cut it into Mohawks, I have no idea. And they also daubed on war paint on their faces for the drop. My only conclusion is whatever boosted their morale. Even today, reenactors during the 75th anniversary of D-Day in 2019, uh, many of them had cut their hair into Mohawks and daubed on the war paint. And these were European young men so it's real interesting to hear reenactors talking with Polish accents and uh, French accents with mohawk and face paint. Whatever their hairstyle and makeup preferences, however, these men were, quote, an elite group that had been superbly trained. This is all the scene of they get in their plane to take off. Red Cross girls, a signal corps, photographer using rare color film, and several members of the 101st Top Brass showed up, quote, to witness the departure of the very first Americans to fight on D-Day as the spearhead of the Allied invasion. Captain Lilliman became the first American to jump into the darkness over Normandy. Once airborne, these Americans were totally on their own. Their planes were not armed, they had no protection against anti-aircraft fire, and they were not accompanied by fighter escorts. Meanwhile, British Major John Howard and his 140 men from D Company of the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, more familiarly known as the Ox and Bucks, thank God, gathered at RAF Tarrant Rushton, where six Horsa gliders made of plywood waited to fly these Brits to their destination. Actually, they had two destinations. One was a bridge over the Conn Canal, codenamed Pegasus, 
and a second bridge was only 400 yards away east and it was over the Orne River. Both bridges had to be taken and held at all costs as they were, quote, essential to securing the eastern flank of the D-Day landings. Above all else, these Brits had to keep German tanks from crossing either bridge. This mission, codenamed Operation Death Stick, had to be accomplished quickly and their positions then held until Brigadier Lord Lovett and his men came up from Sword Beach. Remember that the other British beach was Gold Beach. The whole point of Operation Dead Stick, which had been rehearsed 43 times prior to D-Day, was to secure the British troops' final objective, which was a ridge a few miles east running from the village of Le Hage to Esqueville. This ridge had to be held at all costs. If the Germans kept it, they could continue to fire down on British positions on their beaches and thus impede part of the whole point of D-Day. Lord Levitt was a no-nonsense, do-it-right first-time commander, so much so that, quote, his commandos were probably as perfect a fighting force as could be found anywhere. Lovett, handsome, suave, and debonair, was a, quote, masterful battle planner, utterly at ease under fire, and at times a terrifying disciplinarian. A 32-year-old Oxford grad, Lovett was known to friends as Shimmy. He'd only spent three days in battle since March 1941, but the success of the three commando raids that he'd led had made him a legend among his men. In fact, his successful raid on Dieppe's six-gun battery, while other aspects of this raid failed miserably in August 1942, had led a fellow officer to opine that Lovett was, quote, probably the best military brain on either side in the Second World War, quote. One particular order Lovett gave during the Dieppe raid, said one of Lovett's junior officers, quote, were not the words of a commanding officer in the British Army. They were the order of a Highland chief bent on the total destruction of the enemy. The Dieppe raid had cost the lives of 18 of Lovett's men, so for D-Day, Lovett felt, quote, he had done everything possible to ensure that his part in Operation Overlord would be a success, quote. He'd made sure his men were in prime fighting condition and they'd been guaranteed, quote, massive, unprecedented naval and air support, quote. They were ready. Simultaneously, American Captain Edward Wazinski and Lieutenant John Spaulding were aboard the USS Samuel Chase going over once more a mock-up of Normandy Beach defenses. Omaha Beach, the wider of the two American beaches on D-Day, was five miles long and when I was there it looked to be five miles in width as well and was divided into eight sectors named with colors such as Easy Red, Fox Green, and Dog Green. Dog Green is the section of the beach that the men in Saving Private Ryan were supposed to take. And all of these sections were assigned to the Americans. Both men knew that the best way for their men to survive the landing, quote, was to stay on their feet and keep going, to attack and kill the enemy, quote. There was only one exit from Easy Red sector. It was a draw leading through 100 feet high bluffs where Spalding would land at what they called H hour, 6.32 a.m. The draw, codenamed E1, was heavily defended by the Germans. Spalding was a newbie to Company E, not really ready for primetime combat. Luckily, E Company was commanded by Captain Wazinski, E Company of the 16th Infantry Regiment of the 1st Division, more readily recognized as the Big Red One, also known as BRO, Bro, but Big Red One. This was the only unit to have seen any previous combat, and they saw it in North Africa and Sicily. Wazinski had won the Distinguished Service Cross in Sicily, and he was highly respected by his men. Robert Kappa, the famous Life Magazine war photographer, was on board with Wazinski and Spalding, having chosen to land with the first wave. Of the mood on the ship, Kappa later recalled, 
Quote, being amphibious troops had only one meaning for us. We would have to be unhappy in the water before we could be unhappy on the shore. Sense of humor there, I think. At the same time, at 10.40 p.m. June 5th, 1944, Major Howard and his men prepared to set off for Normandy in their six Orsa gliders. These would be the first British troops to fight on D-Day. The action at Pegasus Bridge is actually the first action to take place on D-Day. And Howard made sure to personally shake the hand of every one of his men as shouts of good luck and see you over the other side rang out. All the while, Howard kept repeating one phrase over and over, ham and jam. Quote, they were the success signal code words for the capture of the bridges intact. For the canal bridge, it was ham, and for the river bridge, it was jam. This phrase, Howard said later, quote, meant a terrible lot to us, quote. Howard was on board glider number one, whose pilot was Jim Walwork. Most of Howard's men, knowing they would be on their own for hours, trying to keep the enemy at bay until relief arrived, had taken all kinds of extra ammo, grenades, bombs, whatever they could stuff into their bags, their rucksacks, inside their blouses, and were so loaded down with these supplies that they had to be boosted up the ladders into the gliders. If any one of them fell over or fell off the ladder, his buddies had to haul him back up. Then they were off, their gliders towed by British Halifax bombers across the channel and then cut loose at 5,000 feet to crash land at 100 miles per hour, hopefully on a narrow landing, bridge, landing strip in the middle of the night with no bomber cover and at the mercy of German flag. The survival of men and material depended on only one thing, their pilot. This pilot, Walwork, had practiced flying blindfolded with a co-pilot calling out times on a stopwatch and readings on a compass. Can you imagine pilots today having to resort to stopwatch and a compass? I can't. Still, Howard had a problem. His glider was overweight. When no man answered his call to drop out, they decided to jettison some supplies. Then the tow rope tightened and they were off, exactly on schedule. One young expectant father, Denny Brotheridge, a, friend, a good friend of Howard's, had lines of a poem for the occasion. Rupert Brooke, who is a very famous British poet and had been a soldier in World War I, wrote in a poem these lines. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. At another English airfield, American C-47s were preparing to take off. Their pilots, keenly aware that that night's mission would be the most important one they'd ever carry out. In one C-47, co-pilot Vito Padone and his lead pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Joel Crouch, began their trip to Normandy at 9.50 p.m. Four minutes later, Crouch reported that he was on his way to France, thus becoming officially, quote, the spearhead of the spearhead of the spearhead, quote, of the D-Day invasion. He and Padone carried with them 18 paratroopers, pathfinders who would be the first Americans to drop into enemy-occupied France. At 11.30 p.m., Crouch saw the English Channel and killed the plane's lights, which would stay off until they headed back to England. Crouch was very aware that he and three-fourths of his fellow pilots could be killed or wounded during the next hour, as that was what planners had predicted. Captain Lilliman was on Crouch's plane when he noticed the glum expressions on his men's faces. When he asked what the problem was, one soldier told him, quote, the captain hasn't got a cigar, quote. Lilliman got a cigar from a pocket and stuck it between his teeth for all to see. Quote, the jump went off without a hitch.
unquote. These guys were very superstitious, and we'll see later some more superstitions. In the Horsa Gliders of the Brits, past midnight, quote, they were on time and on target. The gliders were released by the bombers towing them, and all became silent. The only noise was, quote, air swishing past the sides of the glider. A sound, said one, none of us would ever forget, quote. At the same time, Lilliman and his paratroopers prepared to drop into the 101st northernmost drop zone between St. Mary Glees and St. Martin de Barreville. At 12.15 a.m. on June 6, 1944, arguably the most important day of the 20th century, Frank Lilliman, followed by his paratroopers, became the first Americans to land in France. British gliders were simultaneously crash landing near the Conn Canal and the bridges the Brits were to capture and defend and hold. These gliders were coming in at 90 miles per hour and their pilots hoped no obstacles would be in their way. These gliders were, quote, as flimsy as paper bags in rain, quote, and pilot Jim Walworth couldn't afford to deploy a parachute to slow his glider down as it would probably put the glider's nose into the ground and kill him and perhaps his passengers instantly. At Pegasus Bridge, on the trip that I took, there's a, now a great museum there, and just past the museum on the opposite side, there is an actual one of these horse gliders that people can go and look at. I walk up a flight of stairs, you look in, because these guys couldn't really stand up, they didn't have the headroom. You talk about flimsy, I couldn't believe how flimsy that plane was. It just, it looked like it had been made out of balsa wood, which is what kids make model airplanes out of. How they pulled this off, I have no idea. Finally, flying below the cloud cover, Walworth saw the canal and the bridges, at which point he began flying, quote, by guess and by God, quote, telling his troops to, quote, link arms and prepare for impact, quote. As he drifted with his paratroopers down to French soil, Captain Lilliman finally hit Normandy soil and was immediately menaced by large moving shadows in the moonlight. Slapping a clip into his Tommy gun, he was preparing to open fire on the enemy when one of them bellowed a loud moo. He'd landed among a herd of cows. Relieved, Lilliman began clicking with his cricket. These crickets were small metal signaling devices. These crickets, if you've seen Band Brothers, then you know what they are. They're just little metal kids' toys. I'm still kicking myself because I chose not to buy one when I was in Normandy. They were everywhere. And I thought, hey, it's a kid's toy. I'm not gonna buy one. Now I wish I had. If I had, I could show you what it looked like. In minutes, seven of his men joined Lilliman and immediately came under fire, but just as quickly, the Germans were silenced. Less than 100 yards away stood the church of St. Germain de Barville. Gathering his men in the church graveyard, the men set about putting Eureka radar sets in the church steeple and elsewhere. These sets would, quote, help guide the plane scheduled to drop hundreds of screaming eagles on drop zone A, one of six landing areas for American airborne troops. Quote, one of Lilliman's men spoke French and told the frightened priest at the church what they were doing. He also told his priest, quote, Bonsoir, Padre, you've just been liberated. As British glider pilot Jim Waller toiled to land his plane, the parachute brake kicked in and the glider hit the ground, quote, like a clap of thunder, quote, remembered Major Howard. The occupants of the glider all were tossed about inside, concussed and stunned. Within seconds, however, their training kicked in and the men snapped into attention. They gathered their gear and ammo and smashed through the plywood debris that had blocked the door on landing. Howard noted that Walwork had put them, quote, within 75 yards of the bridge, quote, they were there to capture. The Germans began to fire at the Brits because the Germans are all around. Uh, if you go to the side of Pegasus Bridge today, it's a crossroads. Here there's a hotel and restaurant that actually was there during all this in World War II. Then there's across the street is the canal and the bridge. You know, Americans, when we think of bridges, we think of spans over water. This Pegasus Bridge 
was out in the water and when boats came they would lower the bridge up and once they passed then they would lower the bridge down. The original Pegasus Bridge has been replaced but the original is in the museum yard of the museum that's there to commemorate the actions on that day. The Germans began to fire at the Brits who of course fired back. A German sergeant named Heinz Hickman, quote, had no great respect whatever for the American soldier, quote, and later on we'll hear some more derogatory thoughts from German soldiers about American soldiers. But he felt very differently about the British who scared him. He eventually gave the order to pull back. Once the Germans had pulled back, Lieutenant Dan Brotheridge ran across the bridge calling for his platoon to follow him, which they did, while Howard and his men cleared trenches and dugouts closest to the downed gliders. One of Brotheridge's platoon member went to find the lieutenant and found him mortally wounded in the road to the bridge. Lieutenant Denny Brotheridge thus became the first Allied soldier killed in combat on D-Day. In a poignant aside, his wife Margaret gave birth to a baby girl 17 days later. Close by Pegasus Bridge, in a ditch, glider pilot Jim Walworth and his injured co-pilot John Ainsworth were out of the line of fire. Walworth felt satisfied that he'd done his job and, quote, delivered his boys. Later, Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, head of all Allied Air Forces on D-Day, described Walworth's landing at Pegasus Bridge as, quote, one of the greatest feats of flying of the Second World War, quote. More good news followed for the Brits. After only 10 minutes of fighting, both Pegasus Bridge and the Orm River Bridge had been captured. And so the first message of success went out on D-Day, quote, ham and jam, ham and jam. In the middle of the English Channel, meanwhile, soldiers from the U.S. Army's 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Division were eating steak and eggs for breakfast, and of course some of them were thinking that they might actually be eating their last supper breakfast. 25-year-old Captain Leonard Schroeder, a Maryland man, led F Company and, quote, had memorized the names of the 219 men he led and could recognize the sound of each man's voice in the dark, quote. Most of his men were described as, quote, country boys, squirrel shooters who weren't afraid of the dark and could find their way home in the woods. Most of these men were from Florida, Alabama, and Georgia country boys. Before boarding their landing craft, Schroeder and other officers met with the 2nd Battalion Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Carlton McNeely, and General Theodore Roosevelt, son of America's 26th President. At 56, Roosevelt had, quote, a bad heart and a bum leg, quote, but he begged his superiors to let him go in with the first wave because he thought, quote, it would steady the men to know that I am with them, quote. And he won. They did let him go in. As the meeting broke up, the men became emotional, with Schroeder telling McNeely, well, Colonel, I'll see you on the beach. Somebody in Private Ryan said those very same words. As Schroeder and hundreds of men stood in the dark, a loudspeaker blared Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight David Eisenhower's final message to Allied troops. I'm just going to read you a portion of it. Jared will post the full flyer that was given, a copy was given to each soldier before they left England. Quote, you're about to embark upon the great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. On board another ship, Lieutenant George Kirchner waited with other men of D Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion. An all-volunteer battalion, only one in four men who applied had made the grade to join the 500-strong battalion. Kirchner and his men would be among those Americans who'd been tasked with attacking and taking Pont de Hoc, quote, a headland midway between Utah and Omaha beaches, quote, where German artillery was said to be embedded. In reality, Pont de Hoc was a straight up and down, 
100 foot high cliff, which the rangers had to climb to knock out the German gun batteries at the top of the cliff. Kirchner could get up a 100 foot cliff face loaded down with full combat gear in less than a minute. The men were also upset about a recent change in the commander who would lead them up the cliff. The original commander, Major Cleveland Little, had been removed from duty that night as they were crossing the channel after a violent argument with other officers. What he was so upset about is everybody thought the mission at Pont Hawk was a suicide mission and Major Little was telling everybody that it was a suicide mission, which of course would be terrible for morale if he said it to the men that had to go up the cliff. So the other officers were arguing with him when Cleveland threw a punch. There was a huge melee and he was removed from the Pontefoc mission. Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder thus became the new leader to take these men up the point. Rudder disobeyed Major General Clarence Hubner, the first division's commander, saying of the mission, quote, if I don't take it, it may not go, quote. When Rudder had first seen a photo of Pont de Hoc, a naval officer, some sources will say an intelligence source, told Rudder the mission was a suicide mission in one of the most famous statements, I think, to come out of World War II. This naval officer said, quote, three old women with brooms could keep the rangers from climbing that cliff. Well, to Rudder and his men, when they heard those words, they would have considered the gauntlet thrown. Rudder was under tremendous stress, as predictions were that the Rangers would lose eight out of every 10 men. As Lieutenant George Kirchner stood aboard his ship with his men, waiting to board their landing craft, so they're all going in together in different landing craft. Captain Leonard Schroeder later reminisced about all the, quote, lucky charms, quote, the men wore into battle. Think about Lilliman's cigar. If his men didn't see that cigar, they thought their mission was doomed. Here, watches, bracelets, and photos of wives and children were tucked into helmets, and some of these men wouldn't go into battle without their charms. At 14 miles from the French coast, the men got into their landing crafts. These are Higgins boats. Some of you may have heard of them. Henry Higgins is now considered to be kind of a hero of World War II. Original Higgins boats are pretty rare, but at the museum at Utah Beach, there is an original Higgins boat. And I took many pictures of it because it's a funny looking thing for one thing, but it is what got our guys to the shore. This is a picture of the men as they're disembarking. And you can kind of see the front of the boat falls down and the men step off and wade to shore to the beach. So they get into their landing crafts 14 miles from the French coast. For Schroeder, loading into his landing craft occurred at 4.05 a.m. General Roosevelt loaded up as well, carrying only a pistol and seven rounds, and his cane, proclaiming to all who would listen, quote, that's all I'll need, quote. As the men headed for the beach, they began to hear number nine squadron RAF set loose all 115 Lancaster bombers at 4.53 a.m and these bombers ultimately dropped 634.8 tons of bombs on Pont de Hoc, killing dozens of Germans and terrifying even many more. Today, the land at Pont de Hoc looks like the surface of the moon. There are deep, deep, deep craters left everywhere. You have to really watch yourself when you go there because if you're not careful, you'll fall off into one of these craters. All of them left by bombs. Major razor wire is still in place on the site's perimeter in places, and the concrete hulks of German gun placements are slowly dissolving into the ground. Those things are, to me, very ominous looking. They're huge, they're concrete, some of the walls are 10 feet thick, and they just sort of embody the dark negative energy that I think of when I think of the Nazi regime. All the landing crafts uh, headed to the point struggled in rough sea conditions, and one LCA-860 actually sank, taking Captain Duke Slater, who was a good friend of Lieutenant Kirchner's, down into the deep. Company D thus lost its first men. Other craft began taking on water, with men bailing with their helmets. 
Eventually, thank goodness, Slater and his men were rescued, but only after they'd spent several hours in the rough sea. His men and he were too numb from several hours in 54 degree cold water, so they were sent back to England to recover from their ordeal. Each and every one of them protested, begged to be sent on to Pont Hawk, but the powers that be said, no, you'll go back to England to recover. Slater's absence thus meant Lieutenant Kirchner was now D Company commander, whose job it now was to land more than 100 men on the beach and up the sheer cliffs at Pont Hawk. The rest of Rudder's men followed in their own LCAs, or Higgins boats. Weather was so bad that morning that men could only see about eight feet in front of them. The wind gusted at 15 miles per hour and a strong current buffeted them relentlessly. As the men neared the shore, all they could see was fires resulting from relentless naval shelling that began at 5.50 a.m., the USS Texas being the major ship that shelled Pontahawk. But Rudder and many of his men could tell that the coastline didn't look like what the Pont to Hawk was supposed to look like because it wasn't the right spot. They were badly off course. Kershaw says that these LCAs were manned by British sailors who were only supposed to take orders from another British officer. And when Rudder tried to tell them that they were at the wrong spot, first time his captain, ship captain, refused to listen to him. So as a salty ranger, Rudder told him in no uncertain terms that he was to go left and a little salty language was also utilized and the captain of the LCA immediately veered in the direction that Rudder told him to go. The Germans obviously could see the LCAs now and began firing on the boats. In one craft alone, five men were killed and their bodies mangled by bullets meant to take down bombers. The rangers were still 30 minutes out from Pont Hawk, and no one knew if the men or their boats would make it to the point in time. At the same time, Colonel Schroeder stood in his plywood Higgins boat, approaching the Uncle Red sector of Utah Beach, smelling vomit and diesel. Four of every five men on his boat were sick. And think about it, these guys are using their helmets to bale, vomit, and diesel-laden water out. So imagine what their helmets are going to smell like when they're off the boat. Then the boat ramp dropped and, quote, Schroeder was off first, wading ashore, holding his 45 Colt above his head, quote. It was precisely 6.28 a.m. Dawn had arrived at 5.58 a.m. on that, quote, day of days, and Schroeder is credited with being the very first American to wade ashore on D-Day. Of this event, he later wrote, I knew my company was in the first wave, but I didn't know I was actually going to be the first ashore. Besides, I was too scared to think about it. Once on the beach, Schroeder did spot General Roosevelt running for cover. Roosevelt, quote, had his hand on his cane from which he was never separated. The sight of this man of 56 directing his troops like a conductor with his baton was something. Back at Pont de Hawk, Lieutenant Kirchner and his rangers approached the point at 7 a.m. They are 30 minutes behind schedule, Sheschel, as the Brits would say, under heavy German fire. At 7.09, the boat's ramp went down and the men were told to disembark. Kirchner jumped off and promptly sank to the bottom of a huge bomb crater that was in the water because a lot of these Lancaster bombers had missed Pont de Hawk and instead bombed off the beach in the ocean and so many of these guys fell into these craters went straight to the bottom they had so much gear on them they just drowned they could not fight their way to the top so he falls into an underwater shell crater and consequently was one of the last men on shore within minutes the rangers began launching grappling hooks over the cliff's edge all while dodging german hand grenades the potato mashers about that long, and they began their climb to the top. Sergeant Lynn Lamell made it to the top and rolled into a huge bomb crater for cover. One of the first actions saw a ranger officer and a private running toward a German machine gun nest. A shocked German soldier couldn't believe his eyes. 
And here's where Nazi propaganda kicks in. He's remembered thinking, these were no gum-chewing, cowardly half-breeds, the kind of Americans depicted in Nazi propaganda. One of these, quote, cowardly, quote, Americans promptly killed him. At the same time, Kirchner kept moving as quickly as possible toward the gun batteries he had been sent to destroy. At 7.30 a.m. from Pont de Hoc, the following radio message was sent out. Praise the Lord, signaling that the Rangers had scaled the cliffs at Pont de Hoc. Unfortunately, the gun casemates were empty of their guns. So where were they? Sergeants Lynn Lamell and Jack Coon found the guns finally further inland and aimed directly at Omaha Beach. But they were deserted, no Germans around. And Kirchner notes that they had all their ammo for these guns stacked up very neatly, you know, in piles by the guns, but no Germans. Lamell, using thermite grenades, destroyed the guns and then he and Kuhn rejoined the remnants of Company D. If you remember one of the opening incidences that the Band of Brothers undertake is um, Major Winters is tasked with destroying four German gun placements at a place called Brecourt Manor. It's up on a cliff and these guns too are shelling the beach. Thermite grenades both Lamel and the Band of Brothers throw them down the tubes or the barrels of these guns. The thermite grenades are very hot and they melt the barrels of the guns so that they cannot be fired. During Lamel and Kuhn's search for the guns, Colonel Rudder had been shot in the leg, but he remained as commander of the Rangers. Rudder sent out the following message to Rangers headquarters, located Pont de Hoc, mission accomplished, need ammunition and reinforcements, many casualties, quote. Much later, First Division Commander General Huebner replied, quote, no reinforcements available, all Rangers have landed. So, the rangers stayed on the point, badly outnumbered. They held out for 48 hours. Couldn't believe it. Rudder and Kirchner did just that. They did hold their positions, although Rudder now commanded 90 men out of his original force of 225 rangers. It's an aside, I'll tell you, I get a lot of uh, solicitation mail from a lot of World War II sites. Lynn Lamell is being used in the American Memorial of D-Day. It's someplace in Virginia and evidently he's still alive or is very recently deceased because everything I get from them, they show pictures of him now who, and he encourages people to donate to this memorial because a lot of people can't afford to go to France. Finally, two landing craft arrived at Pont de Hoc with ammo, food, and water, and 24 men, one of whom told Rudder that more rangers were on the way. Quote, Rudder's men gorged on spam, those our old friend spam again, bread and jam, and reloaded their weapons. Quote, in all, the rangers held out at Pont de Hoc under very heavy fire for over two days, and they did hold their positions. Two weeks later, Colonel Rudder, Lieutenant Kirchner, Sergeant Lamell, and 11 other rangers received the Distinguished Service Cross. Rudder, tears streaming down his cheeks, told his men, quote, this medal does not belong to me, it belongs to you. One of his men shouted back, you keep it for us. Lynn Lamell became a successful lawyer after the war. George Kirchner became an infantry instructor and later president of an ice cream company. For all you Texans out there, including myself, Colonel Rudder became, quote, the most distinguished and trusted president in the history of Texas A&M University, quote, where in 1963, he oversaw the integration of women into the then all-male school. During my time at Rice, I heard a couple versions of that story. Captain Frank Mulliman, the first U.S. soldier to jump into North Normandy stayed in the Army after the war and retired in 1968 as a lieutenant colonel. He died in 1971, very good year, at the youthful age of 55. British Major John Howard and his glider pilot, Jim Walwork, 
Both survived the war and visited Pegasus Bridge numerous times. Pegasus Bridge is not the original name of that bridge that they captured and held. Can't think now what it was originally called, but after the war it was renamed Pegasus Bridge in honor of the insignia of the division of the military that he was in. The insignia consists of an image of Pegasus, the winged horse of mythology. They survived the war and especially Howard went back many, many times to Pegasus Bridge. He became very good friends with the family that owned the little restaurant and hotel that faced Pegasus Bridge. He went back numerous times and there are lots of pictures of him revisiting Pegasus. Walworth died in, in 2013 at the age of 93 and had asked that his ashes be spread near the bridge. His request was honored. Scotsman Lord Levitt was severely wounded near the bridge over the Orne River. However, he survived his wounds and after the war returned to his Scottish estate, all 200,000 acres of it. Later in life, his two sons met very tragic deaths, as did his 200,000 acre estate. Both American Captain Edward Wazinski and Lieutenant John Spaulding survived the war. In 1959, however, Spaulding's second wife shot and killed him after an argument. He was only 44 years old. Captain Leonard Schroeder, thought to be the first American infantryman to come ashore on D-Day, remained in the Army after the war, serving in both Korea and Vietnam. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, whose photo today is literally all over Normandy, was made the military governor of the Port of Cherbourg, which fell on June 30th. It is on the coast, not too far from Hong Kong. On July 11th, Roosevelt and his son Quentin visited until 10 p.m. Quentin had landed on Omaha Beach on June 6th with the Big Red One, which is also the 1st Infantry Division. The Big Red One, remember, is sometimes called the BRO. Only a few hours later, Quentin learned his father had died of a heart attack after he had left his visit with his father. Roosevelt, the oldest D-Day general and the oldest son of a famous president, was buried on July 14, 1944, in St. Mary Glaze. One of the pallbearers of Roosevelt's funeral was General George Patton, who in his diary called Roosevelt, quote, the bravest man he ever knew. Quote. Later, Roosevelt's body was reinterred next to that of his brother, who had been a pilot in World War II and was killed in combat at Colville sur Mer. Remember, that's the big American cemetery just off Omaha Beach. General Dwight David Eisenhower survived the war and in 1952 was elected the 34th President of the United States. Ernie Pyle, the famous war correspondent, saw the devastation on Omaha Beach on June 8th, D-Day plus two. Bloated corpses of American soldiers were still washing in with the tide. Pyle observed, quote, there were toothbrushes and razors and snapshots of families back home staring up at you from the sand. There were pocketbooks, metal mirrors, extra trousers, and bloody abandoned shoes. There were broken handled shovels, portable radios smashed almost beyond recognition, and mine detectors twisted and ruined. Pyle tried his best to convey the price of D-Day to his millions of readers in the United States, but words he knew could never adequately convey the extent of the devastation, both human and material. Quote, the wreckage was vast and startling, the awful waste and destruction of war, even aside from the loss of human life, has always been one of its outstanding features to those who are in it. Anything and everything is expendable. And I'm going to close this review by saying items are continually washing up on the beach, beaches of Omaha and Utah and probably the other three beaches as well. And the Peace Museum that we saw before we saw any of the beaches. They had a special section of the museum where it was called Beach Finds, and there were lots of gun parts that were totally encrusted with barnacles. So even though the war's been over close to 80 years now, remnants of it are still washing up on the beach. Thank you for your attention.